everybody. Let's get this started. So I'm very excited to host today a uh, masterclass in leadership, managing teams effectively. So thank you all for joining today's uh, webinar. I'm Tom Jones, CEO and founder of Iridium Technology. Before I introduce you to the panel, the program and its panelists, let me say a few words about the organization that brings this content to you. The Legal Value Network is a growing community of more than 800 business of law professionals. LVN's board and numerous volunteers are all working together to bring its members curated content by the way of webinars, the Council of Luminaries series, a monthly e-newsletter, its off-the-clock podcast, and the recently published Legal Pricing and Practice Management Survey. LVN is also providing ways for this community to engage with one another through its roundtable programs, its Women's Initiative Forum, and of course, through its annual user conference that is set for October 6th through 8th, 2021. I'll be there. I hope to see you all there. This webinar was brought to you by the LVM Webinar Committee comprised of 15 individuals who've been working for months to develop a full slate of 2021 educational offerings for LVM members. Content is focused on three educational tracks, innovation, pricing in LPN, and LPM, and beyond the technical. Today's webinar is part of the Beyond the Technical Track. If you're not yet an LVN member, visit LegalValueNetwork.com and select Become a Member tab and sign up today to ensure you continue to enjoy all the offerings and be sure to follow LVN on LinkedIn and Twitter. We have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The only video feed you see going to see is that of the presenters. Everyone will be on mute except for the presenters. We will record this session and it will be available at LegalValueNetwork.com after the event. And finally, questions are encouraged, so please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar, not the chat feature, Q&A, to post your questions. And with that, let's get to our program, Managing Teams Effectively, a master class. I'm excited to introduce our panelists. We have Tazneem Koka, the Managing Director of Growth Play. Josh Klenoff, the founder of Helm, and Stephen Merkel, Chief Operating Officer of Borns and Thorn Thornburg LLP. I'll have each of you introduce yourself, tell a little bit about your business and about your management style. Tazneem, you're up and welcome. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Tom. Hi, everyone. It's so delightful to be here. And um, Tom, Josh, Steve, I'm so delighted to join you on this panel. Uh, my name is Tasneem Koka, and I am a managing director at Growth Play. Uh, my business is helping lawyers be more lovable. <laughs> I am a strategic growth consultant uh, for law firms, do a fair amount of work in the space of business development, training, coaching, and consulting to help law firms uh, grow uh, sustainably and predictably. Um, and my path to that um, was, has been a circuitous one. I uh, was a practicing lawyer at a couple of large uh, global firms based here in Chicago, um, and then uh, became a, an executive in law firms. I was the chief marketing officer for a large global firm before I decided to um, go into consulting. I've been consulting for about the last decade now with firms across the country and increasingly around the globe. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. So thank you so much for having me. Oh, my, man uh, my leadership style. I would say probably the, the one thing that I would use to describe my leadership style most is um, the servant leader model. Um, I very much uh, believe in upending the pyramid and approach, uh, approaching leadership as an act of service. Very good. And, and I am the pace setter. And the advantages of that is people never feel, hey, Tom's not doing his share of the work, but there is pressure to keep up. So uh, Josh, take it away. Tell us about yourself and Helm. A pleasure, and thanks for inviting me. Wonderful to be with you all. So I founded a firm called Helm 10 years ago, and as someone who's built a few companies leading up to this, I, uh, I struggled as the founder of different companies getting out of the day-to-day, -day. and that's our purpose, actually, to help founders, presidents, CEOs, and owners get out of the day-to-day, -day, get out of the weeds, and ultimately systematize their organizations. We work with small and mid-sized companies and ultimately help systematize so that the entire organization can get everyone rowing in the same direction with a crystal clear vision and really strong discipline and execution around their day-to-day -day execution and uh, leadership style. Well, um, I don't know if I can pigeonhole myself with any 
uh, with any well, well-known style, but I call myself a visionary. Our entire universe and client base is visionaries. And that's someone who loves to get outside their four walls, even in, and especially in COVID, um, and set the direction for the organization, build big relationships, place bets, set the strategy, and really establish the culture. Super, and I've worked with Josh and Helm in the past, and they've really helped Iridium to take its game to the next level. Steven. Hey, Tom, thank you very much. And uh, let me just say, I am uh, could not be more excited to, uh, to spend today with Tom and uh, Tasneem and Josh and everybody out there listening. I'm Steve Merkel, the Chief Operating Officer for Barnes & Thornburg. I am uh, exactly 10 days shy of four years um, in that role. And that's exactly um, the same amount of time that I have with um, experience in the legal industry. And that's because I spent uh, the 30 years um, preceding starting here at Barnes and Thornburg uh, in the Army as, a, uh, as an officer, graduated from the Military Academy out at West Point, um, in, incredible journey, and quite honestly, you know, was fortunate to lead teams as small as 10 to 15, I guess, to as large as, you know, several thousand. And so we um, learned a lot in that, uh, in that process. Um, all of which, and there are so many um, fun and exciting similarities between the military profession and the legal profession that have, uh, that have helped me out. Now, with respect to leadership style, I think what I would say is I strive to be um, transformational. And um, some days I do better than others. Um, but there are really, there are a number of things, I think, that um, characteristics that transformational leaders have. But it's, those are really the leaders that people um, follow because they want to not because they have to. And that'll be fun to talk about here, I think, in, uh, in just a little bit. Could not be more excited and thank you all. Very good. Uh, we have some questions and some will be questions addressed to the group and uh, we'll roll through those and then some are specific based on the, uh, the background of the, the target person. So I'll start off by saying, for each of you, what tools have you put in place to define and reinforce your firm's cultures and values? And I'll say for all three of you, there's two ways you can answer this. You can talk about your f firm, Growth Player or Helm or Barnes and Thornburg, or you can talk about the broader, hey, my experience in the army or the clients I work with. So kind of a free form style here. Tools you put in place to reinforce your firm's culture and values, Tasneem. Um, Tom, I'm so glad that you started a with question about culture and values because my experience with uh, leadership has been that many people f approach leadership from the perspective of what is it that I have to do as a leader in order to get people to follow me, right? So we think about what actions are required to get the result that we're looking for. And I often find that approaching leadership first from the perspective of who do I want to be, not so much what do I want to do, but who do I want to be, what matters to me, what are my values and my priorities, what culture am I trying to create? Um, that to me is a far more effective and, um, and uh, meaningful leadership approach. And so um, as I think about in particular, the tools that I that I put into place in our company growth play to, uh, to reinforce our values and our cultures, a big part of it was number one, naming our values and our cultures. I think many of our organizations don't do enough uh, self-reflection to actually do the hard work of understanding who we are and who we want to be and defining our values and priorities so that we can put them into action. So one of the things that we've done over the course of the, um, the years that we've been in business together is really work hard to understand what those values are and name them and frame them. Um, so we have a set of core values uh, that we hold as a company. And, um, and those are things that we share. We talk about how we want to be, we want to um, have service and generosity and love, uh, believe it or not, in a business in a growth consulting business in the legal industry love is a core value of ours but um, we've talked to we've defined those core values the other tool that we've put into place in addition to defining those core values is defining the behaviors that uh, that that we expect of each other um, in uh, as expressions of those core values. So I'll give you a very simple example. Um, one of our uh, core values is around uh, honor and respect. 
And so one of the ways that that gets translated into behavior is that we believe that uh, showing up prepared to any meeting, whether that's with colleagues, with clients or otherwise, isn't as it is a sign of honor and respect that when we don't show when we show up unprepared, we are we are communicating to the people with whom we're spending time that their time is not as valuable as ours. And so one of the ways that we action right that we put into action the value of honor and respect for one another is by always showing up prepared um, or having a really good excuse why you're not prepared but by and large that that um, that honor uh, that that value around um, preparation as a sign of honor and respect is one that we put into place. So I would say those are the two tools that we put into place. Number one, just simply defining, doing the self-reflection to define those values. And then number two, associated behaviors that demonstrate those um, values in very concrete ways. Very good. And honor is such a nice segue to Stephen. Take it away. Yeah, no, that is, Tasneem, that is absolutely brilliant. And it's interesting because could not agree more. So it, it's so much on the on the value of um, step one, define, no kidding. I mean, have the courage to, to articulate to the team um, what you value and what's important. And I always remember uh, I had a boss who, who you know, at one point, because it's kind of fun. So um, one of the jobs I was fortunate to have in the military was I, I commanded the Corps of Cadets at the military academy. And so you're pro everybody's probably thinking, oh, my gosh, that must have been so much fun. 4,400 incredible young adults. And it was. But I also had to do all of the discipline. So I got into a conversation one day with my boss about, um, you know, why do things why don't things always happen the way you expect? And ultimately, I will never forget um, what he said. He's, you know, invariably, there are three big things. You know, one is that um, the individual didn't understand what it was that you wanted them to do. You never told them in a way that they could kind of internalize it and understand it and wrap their arms around it. And that's why it's so incredibly important, I think, to articulate and name those values exactly like you heard Tasneem say. The second one is um, they didn't do it because they didn't have the resources to do it. And sometimes that is, um, can be training, can be development, can be um, time, energy, money, all of the above. Well, interestingly enough, if you think for just a second, those first two, and those are leadership issues, really. Those belong to the leaders um, with respect to properly articulating what it was you wanted to do and then, you know, resourcing it. Now, number three, that's the easy group. That's the group that um, just you can't connect all the dots. They know what you want them to do. They've got the resources to do it, but they just can't do it. That's the, that's the, honestly, the easiest group um, to, to deal with. So when it comes to culture, I think some people, and I'm certainly guilty of this, that people think, oh my gosh, it's so big and culture is, um, it takes so long and is so hard to change. And all of that is true, that really what we try to focus on, and it's interesting, we have a thing in the military we call command climate. And it really was, it was what kind of atmosphere, what kind of environment do you establish as a leader on your team locally? Because the reality is, although it took me a while to figure it out, your team will 100% adopt your attitude, your values, um, and, and the way that they do things eventually. So it really is, okay, what can I do? And I'm a big fan of, you know, um, leading from the front, be genuine, be sincere. And, and, in, and it's interesting because I'm a firm believer that humility and not asking people to do things you're not willing to do yourself is the fundamental um, number one value when it comes to leaders. And hopefully we can talk about that more in a little bit. So what does that look like with respect to tools? Well, here at Barnes and Thornburg, we, we do the same thing. We named our values. We tell the entire team what's important. We do that in our strategic plan, but then reinforce it um, every time the firm managing partner, the office managing partner, myself, you know, we go out or we engage with the group to remind the team of what's important, um, what we value. And then I think it's also important then to um, get feedback. Okay, how are we doing? What do you think? And so we just started at the beginning of the year uh, an engagement survey. We're now two or three cycles into it. It has been um, fascinating. Fascinating because oftentimes, you know, I'd like to think that I know what kind of, how we're doing and what kind of feedback we're going to get. And there have absolutely been some surprises. 
Um, and that's great because it, that's the first step in, okay, you know what, this message really isn't res resonating or people are really having a harder time wrapping their arms around what does it mean to, to you know, to, to be honorable in our line of work and that kind of thing. And so um, really would focus on, for us, it's, it's that naming aspect that we do in the strategic plan and with a feedback loop that we've now incorporated as part of the engagement survey. Very nice. Josh, I, I will pivot the question a little bit for you and say, when you come in to work with a new organization, how often do they not have the culture and values established? And does that go to priority number one for you? Well, it all depends on what you mean by do they not have it established. There's always some culture, often, <laughs> in, in, uh, you know, and what is culture? It's really nothing more than your values in action, your values expressing themselves in the types of conversations people have, their tone, their patience, how they dress, the furniture, everything is an expression really of values. Um, and, you know, it's the, gosh, there's so much to, to say on this, but I'd probably zoom out a bit and say, um, working with a very diverse array of companies, um, one observation I've had is you, you can't really grow a company as a leader. Um, and I think of it a lot like farming. You, you don't, farmers don't grow food. They cultivate the conditions that enable food to grow. And as a leader, you cultivate the conditions for an organization to grow. So you know, for 25 years now, I've been implementing tools as an entrepreneur and a consultant and in different contexts. And tools are, of course, devastatingly powerful when used right in the right context. Um, we would be nothing more than cavemen and cave women if we didn't have tools. With all our fancy knowledge, you don't, you don't have fire. Oh, no. Can't do anything, right? So um, I actually zoom out. Josh is on holiday. It looks like his uh, hotel Wi-Fi has frozen. Oh, uh-oh. I can hear Josh okay. Right, I can't. Uh, is everybody hearing He's me going. okay? Yeah. Josh, we can hear you. I Tom, think actually maybe Tom's wife. I think it might be my problem. All right, you guys keep talking. Okay, okay. Um, so, you know, zooming out a bit, I, I think that while tools can be devastatingly effective, um, we actually have shifted to what I think of as a transactional or iterative approach with honing a particular tool to a transformational approach by implementing a system of tools and by system, I mean they work in tandem with each other. They reinforce each other in many powerful ways. So one example would be um, like a tool we, um, we're probably all familiar with, a KPI. It's a, a, a certain metric you assign. And another tool is something we call the weekly roundtable. It's a weekly meeting each group has. Uh, a third tool is a process map where you have each process, the person accountable for driving it, and the date the next check-in is due to ensure it's happening and happening right. So what is a system? A system says, well, now that you've got this thing called a KPI, it's a lot more powerful if you combine it with that weekly roundtable meeting. And every week, each group meets and they bring their dashboard of KPIs with the target and the actual filled in so we can see if anybody fell short on these critical metrics to gauge the most important value they should be creating. And that weekly meeting has a number of components, just one of which is the dashboard, in order to smoke out all the most important problems and get them solved at the root level. Well, let's just suppose that you've got a KPI that says, we want someone to, um, to generate a certain level of new business for the firm. And you see that that's lagging. And then you get into that weekly round table and you get to the root of it and you see that they're not following a process for going on enough meetings face-to-face -face or using their LinkedIn or whatever the process is. So then we turn to that third tool, the process map and say, what's the, what's the real root of this? Well, no one's driving that process, right? They're, Sally, who was supposed to drive it, left our company six months ago and no one's checking in on the lawyers to make sure they're following the process. So, in, in systematizing a company, what we look to do is not just solve problems at a more superficial level, so they go away, out of mind, out of sight. 
with what I call more symptomatic approach, but solve them at the root. So they go away for good. And ultimately every company is only as successful as its ability to solve its biggest problems. Most companies are more firefighting oriented, solving them at that surface level. And very few understand, Tom, to your question of, do they have cultures? Very few understand how to really root out and solve their biggest problems so they go away for good. Yeah, and, and I loved your point that if you haven't defined a culture, you actually have defined a culture, it's just not a very good one. So um, good, well, we're gonna move on to some one-on-one -on -one questions. I'll start with Stephen. Stephen, many leaders would look at your time in the army and say, wow, that must be great to just be able to tell your soldiers what to do and have them do it immediately with no questions asked. Truth or misconception? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, misconception, kind of. So, so the wonderful thing is that works um, for the majority of time until the task at hand, I think either becomes um, too difficult or too dangerous. And then what happens, and it really comes down to um, what kind of leader are you? And so um, we have transactional leaders and transactional leaders will lead their teams based on the authority of the position they hold. Meaning for the vast majority of the time, you've got to do what I say because I'm the brigade commander and you're going to get in serious trouble if you don't. And the vast majority of time when it's not dangerous or difficult, people make a calculated decision that says, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do that because whatever Steve does to me is going to be worse and we're fine. The challenge becomes when things do become too, too dangerous or too difficult, um, especially um, too dangerous um, because uh, the desire for self-preservation is powerful. And I have seen things in my multiple deployments um, that, um, I mean, at first they surprised me, um, shocked me. And I will, I'll never forget, you know, after um, we had recently um, gotten into Baghdad, um, it was, I was with a, a unit out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. I replaced a battalion commander on the ground and we're out on our first patrol and sure enough, um, make contact. We end up um, handling that situation and I get back in my Humvee and we're heading back to the, uh, to the headquarters and my driver, um, says, hey, sir, really appreciate you being with us tonight. And I, I remember thinking to myself, well, that's, man, that's odd. And I was right. like, Nick, I said, why do you say that? And he said, you know, he said, um, we're just not used, we're not used to the commander being out here with us. Um, it really meant a lot. And I was like, ooh, boy, that is interesting. And so there's a, that, that other kind of leader you heard me talk about, um, the transformational leader. And, and they'll lead their teams, you know, because based on the relationships they have with their subordinates. And it's like, you don't have to be your subordinates' friends, but they got to know that you're genuine. They got to know that you're human. And so how do you do that? Well, the truth is um, you do it every day, whether you realize it or not, or probably ought to be. You know, when you hear um, leaders talk about uh, their families, their vacations, what they're experiencing, all of those are helping to make a connection. If you look over my shoulders, it won't take you two seconds to kind of figure out in my life um, the things I value. You see pictures of uh, my wife, Christine, and our kids and their, their you know, husband and wife. And, and I talk about my family a lot. And what that does is it creates that um, connection, that relationship, incredibly strong. And so I found that um, when things do get dangerous and difficult, I don't even have to look over my shoulder because I know the team is there. And it's crazy because some people may think, well, Steve, that's, real, that's great. And that probably only works in the military and in combat. And the reality is I would offer that while, while your life might be not be in danger day in and day out in what we do in the legal industry, the reality is many of the decisions we make and the situations that we encounter, they're hugely important. And, and so your, your, you know, life preservation, you know, from a business perspective, oh, it's very real. And so um, it's important as a leader to establish those relationships so that um, your team will follow you, not because they have to, but because they want to. And um, that's what I found out, um, you know, one of the lessons in the military. 
Very good. And we're, we're trying to give people concrete takeaways today. And I'll share one thing that we do at Iridium to build those relationships is every Zoom meeting, we start off with what we call the segue. And that is to say, Stephen, how was your weekend? How's your wife doing? Tasneen, tell me about, you know, whatever. But that you know that people have dogs and kids and what their hobbies are. And of course, we always talk about golf. But that really brings the relationships in. It's a fun part and a good way to start the meeting. So very good. Moving on to Tajneem, you spent your career leading and contributing to teams where you were often the only person of color or woman on the team. What can we learn from your experience about how to effectively lead, lead teams with increasing diversity? Um, thanks, Tom. I am excited to talk about this one because um, the the current climate and the, the year that we've had with um, increasing attention to racial injustice in our country and the value of diversity and, and equity and inclusion in our organizations is um, top of mind for so many of us. And yet navigating that um, is for many uncharted territory. And, um, and it's one, it's territory that I've been charting um, for, for my whole life. Um, and so some of the things that I've um, learned in that one is, um, I think one of the things that is uh, that is a, a a new opportunity when we have more diversity in our teams is the opportunity to recognize and learn to navigate difference. Um, I think there is a, a, a there's this myth out there that um, that good relationships and good teams and uh, and high functioning teams focus more on what they have in common than their differences. And yet, I think one of the things that we have the opportunity to do when we're working in diverse teams is not necessarily force looking for common ground, but rather learning to recognize and appreciate and navigate effectively difference um, and becoming comfortable with the discomfort of difference and becoming comfortable with how to recognize and, uh, and navigate difference, I think is an important skill that all of us as both leaders and contributors to teams um, can develop. So that's, that's one thing that I've, uh, I've seen a lot of. As it relates to that, I think one of the things that is in, uh, that is important to do when we're learning to recognize and navigate difference is to um, stay in the state of um, perceiving and learning before we move to judgment and, and decision making and action. I think um, as, as leaders and often as team contributors, we're often looking for, okay, what do I know? What can I, uh, what decision do I need, make, need to make and how do I get into action? And when it comes to uh, navigating difference, I think one of the things that we have to do is to actually stay in that state of perceiving and learning for a little bit longer so that we can actually see difference for what it is as opposed to quickly moving to decision making or judgment. And so um, there's been some really interesting uh, scholarship out there about um, the value of uh, mindfulness uh, types of techniques. Um, one of my uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, Denise Robinson, who's a DEI consultant in the legal in industry, uh, talks about how mindful te mindfulness techniques can be used to interrupt things like implicit bias for example. And I think thinking about mindfulness and, and those kinds of uh, disciplines, which are also very au courant right now, and, and the connection that they have to our, uh, our desire to create more diversity and equity and inclusion in our teams can be a really valuable one. Um, and then I would say, lastly, you know, I would I would bring it back to values and culture. I think one of the things that organizations and leaders have to do is decide how important is diversity, equity, and inclusion to you as a as a leader and as a and as an organization. Um, because as we've talked about already. Um, people do what they value, right? And and advancing DEI. Uh, values within our organizations it takes work, it takes time, it takes resources, it takes attention. It may cause us to change the ways that we do business. Um, it may mean that we have to revisit well-worn um, uh, habits and, and, and processes and, and, and ways of doing things and have to shift how we allocate resources or how we, um, the systems and processes uh, to, uh, to Josh's point that exist within our organizations. 
Um, but none of that happens unless we've decided that's it, that it's important enough for us to spend our time and energy and resources on it. And right. so I think one of the things that um, that organizations and leaders especially have to um, have to really embrace is how important is this to us, and what kind of um, as and and given that value, what kind of time, resources, and energy and attention are we willing to give to it? Very good. And, and Tasneem, so I, I'm going to pivot Josh's next question. Uh, because I liked what you had to say there. Josh, what Tajneem was saying about, you know, spending more time on the discussion and investigating rather than just jumping to the conclusion sure reminded me of IDS and traction. Um, and I know you're a big fan of mindfulness. So I'll, I'll give you the mic and say, what are your thoughts on those topics? So I, IDS is an acronym for identify, discuss, and solve. And I touched on that with the last point. The um, the reason that tool exists is to help companies first surface or identify their biggest challenges. And that's a, that's a prerequisite, of course, for solving problems. Um, the challenge in a lot of companies is that people don't feel the trust required, a vulnerability-based trust to um, to put their, th their ideas on the table because the fear is someone's gonna chop it off, right? And the reason that fear exists um, is trust takes a long time to earn and you commit political suicide in a lot of companies. Law firms are probably at the top of the list if you're in any way critical of someone else, especially someone who's a superior, right? So. The challenge implicit in that, right? And we're just at the identify of ideas, Tom. I'll just leave it there. When you have people who don't trust, they can't engage in meaningful conflict, right? And conflict is essential because conflict is how you have a, a, an exchange of ideas in order to ferret out which one is right. And if people can't put ideas on the table because they're afraid of that, you're not going to get people challenging other people. And then what happens is you have a certain faction of people meeting and one, two, three of them are dominating the meeting, coming up with an idea and everybody else just shuts up. They mind their business. They're not gonna put their career on the line. And so whatever solution gets hatched at that meeting, the rest of the people are thinking, I'm not committed to that. I never said anything. And so you have a company that's basically kind of like you know, the, in a sense, just good enough, not really fired up or ignited about some broader purpose, not deeply passionate about the mission. They're showing up, they're getting their job done. And when you have that, you can't drive accountability in an incredible way. And the results suffer as a result. You can force results through brute force to some extent, but you have to work a lot harder to get them when you don't have that trust and that healthy conflict. It's kind of, it's kind of incredible. Um, just to bridge one point, Tom, with what, uh, with what uh, Tasneem was saying, values are so crucial to this equation of ideas, of identifying and putting challenges on the table, having people be open and honest. You can't solve problems if no one's putting them out there. And values are so central to that because when you're with people, that share your core values, that aren't in conflict with your core values, you have an innate level of trust. When you're with people who are in deep conflict with your values, that drops off a cliff. And we saw this up close. My mentor and partner was a guy, Tom, you know, Marshall Goldsmith. He was, I, I think, probably coached to more Fortune 500 CEOs than anyone. And in October of 2000, he was down in Austin, Texas, he was gonna coach the leadership team of a company the next day. They took the evening to bring their executives together, show a beautiful video of their values. And it showed kids playing in a sprinkler and talked about their commitment to community, spoke about integrity and transparency. And he couldn't coach them because the next day they were indicted. That was Jeff Skilling at Enron. So values are usually a lot of lip service. Um, and the last thing I'd, I'd close with here is actually values are very simple. They're very simple to figure out. And without a strong leader dedicated to systematizing their company, it ain't going to happen, right? You just, 
it's too hard and fish stinks from the head down. You need a strong leader that's going to systematize and yes, one question, what, and, and excuse my, my language here, but very bluntly put, what pisses you off? That's your values. Because you don't have to think too hard in your career about what really frustrated you, and that reveals your values. And if you hire by that, screening out people that are in deep conflict, and you cultivate those values throughout. And then third, and most importantly, people who don't, who are in conflict with those values and are irreparably in conflict, if you don't fire them, you'll be seen as hypocritical and worse than worthless with your values because you, you, you have these, these values that you purport, you purport to hold and you're doing nothing about them. Yep, and, and a couple of thoughts come to mind. Uh, first of all, I, I'm always a man in a hurry and IDS, uh, there's identify, discuss and solve and I, I'm always IS, right to solve. We got this problem, let's jump over here. And so my staff is trained to say, Tom, IDS, IDS. And uh, we do the same thing. The other thing is our values. It's on our website, it's on our internet. We actually have a program called Karma where I can say, Josh, thank you for communicating openly and honestly or delivering exceptional results. But those values, they've gotta be short enough and succinct enough and meaningful enough that your employees are actually living by them. And we have our primary core value is we always do what is best for our clients. And it's very important. The most important letter there is the S on clients is sometimes what's doing best for your clients is taking a hard stance with one of your clients to say, hey, you're too demanding or you know, you're unreasonable. We can't, if, if I do this for you, 20 other clients will suffer. So uh, you know, we're all in this together. Um, next question for the group leadership. Is it an innate trait or is it a skill that can be learned? And I'd say, if you believe it's a skill that can be learned, tell me how you're improving your own skills. Let's start with Steven. Sure. No, great question. Um, and it's interesting. So this was always a topic of discussion, uh, you know, especially back at the military academy um, with, with the leader development, you know, program. Um, and, and here's, I think it's a combination, just to kind of put the bottom line up front. Um, and I say that because I think there are um, certain values uh, experiences, obviously, that um, define kind of who we are on that journey of life. And so long before you ever became, you know, a leader of a team, all of those things had happened and they had helped program you. And, and it's hard, can be done, but it's hard to change some of those deeply held, well, you know, funded, founded um, values. Now, I think you can teach uh, and help develop some of those. And so in order to be able to kind of understand this, I would, I would offer, you know, the good leaders that I think about that I have experienced in the military or in the legal industry um, have always done four things really well. And it's interesting because even as, you know, as everybody's been listening to, um, to Tazanim and Josh and Tom, you've heard these um, already. Okay, the first one, I think all good leaders um, are fundamentally humble. They're humble in the sense of kind of what I said before about, hey, look, they're not going to ask you to do something they're not going to do themselves. That's hugely important because that builds that foundation of trust that you just heard Josh talk about. But there's also intellectual humility. And that's the idea that, hey, look, I don't have all the answers. Um, I, I, we need everybody's perspective. We need everybody's input. And so that's why it was interesting to listen to, uh, to Taz Neem. We talked about the perceiving and learning. You gotta be intellectually humble, you know, in order to truly be, put yourself in the right mindset to be open to those other ideas and that kind of thing. Number two, um, all the good leaders I've known, they've been um, vulnerable. They have been, um, they've been genuine. And that's because of that relationship that they had to have with their subordinates so that those subordinates would follow them because they wanted to, not because they had to. 
Number three, I think all the good leaders I've worked with have held themselves and their subordinates accountable. And I will be completely candid. I was really good at holding myself accountable. Or I was my biggest critic. Nobody, I, trust me, long before any of my bosses or my wife, the love of my life, told me where I might have been falling short, I already knew it and um, was already trying to self-correct. I had a hard time holding other people accountable. And then I realized, you know, if you really care about somebody, if you really want to invest in them, hold them accountable. Let them know what didn't work out the way that you had envisioned. Talk about why that happened and help them be better. I can't think of a more genuine, sincere way to tell people that they're valued members of the team than to hold them accountable. And then finally, all the good leaders, man, they've been courageous. And, and I don't know, it'll be interesting. I, I don't know for Tasneem and Josh, but you know, some of the hardest decisions I've had to make, they've been the decisions that dealt with people. Um, where, you know, more often than not, the toughest one is, you know, people that are on the very high end of the spectrum that are just like super performers, man, they're easy to, they're easy to lead, they're easy to deal with. Man, just keep reinforcing success and there, it's amazing. The ones at the bottom end, man, those are kind of easy to deal with too, because it's cut and dry kind of what you have to do. It's the ones that fall smack dab in the middle that, oh man, they're not superstars and they're not really, uh, that, um, but you still got to have the courage to make those decisions as a leader. And so that's why I say you can do things on all four of those to help um, strengthen, um, reinforce um, those characteristics in a leader, but there is still this fundamental fabric that is who you are. Um, and it's the way that you think that you're still building upon. So I love Josh's, you know, the, and I'm a farm boy. I'm 100% serious, grew up on a farm down in Southern Indiana as a little kid. It is, um, I love it. I use the orchard um, analogy sometimes when I, often when I'm talking about stewardship and what it means to be a steward. And, and, and it dawned on me, you know, when Josh was talking about the cultivation and about um, setting the conditions for growth, it's, it's, you know, we all realize that if you plant a peach sapling and that peach sapling kind of stood for your, you know, your values, your kind of what you stand for, your fabric, nothing you do is going to change that peach sapling as it grows into an apple tree. You're still going to have a peach tree when it's all said and done. Now, you might be able to graft on other limbs and that kind of thing, but fundamentally, you still got a peach tree. And so that's why I say I kind of see it as a combination. You have what you have um, based on who you are and your experiences and your journey, but you definitely can do things to help um, strengthen some of those most important characteristics. Very good. And I'd say for all our listeners, uh, if you only take away one thing today, it is if you are not holding someone accountable, you're not doing them any favors. You're setting them up for failure. So uh, as a leader, sometimes you got to take a tougher stance, and that's a good one to start on. Tasneem, innate or learned trait, leadership. Um, so I'm going to amplify, uh, Tom, the, the thing that you pointed to about what Steve said about holding people accountable. So we have an, a motto in our company about that, um, which is that feedback is a gift even when it's wrapped in barbed wire. <laughs> mm. um, it's this idea that um, if you, you know, it, feedback requires discomfort, right? It, it requires discomfort on the part of the feedback giver as well as the feedback uh, recipient. And yet, if you care about someone's success and you want them to be at their very best, you will offer them that feedback, notwithstanding the discomfort to you and to them um, because you want them to succeed. Um, and I think it's important uh, that when you are the feedback giver, you really take that to heart and approach the offering of feedback from the perspective of my goal is to help you succeed, not to vent my disappointment or to have someone to blame or whatever it would be. So anyway, um, innate or uh, cultivated. I, um, I am gonna go with, uh, with the popular Steve answer, yes and. <laughs> uh, I, think it is, uh, I think it is a bit of both. I think um, because uh, I'll go back to what I said uh, earlier, which is this idea that um, because leadership uh, first and foremost is about values and priorities, um, those are things that, um, that we don't learn. Those, those are things that we maybe uncover 
right? Or that, that we develop over time that through self-reflection and things like that. Um, and they are who we are. They're, they're um, not necessarily innate, but, but certainly um, uh, part of who we are as opposed to a skill that we develop. Um, so from that perspective, I think leadership is very much about who we are. Um, and that being said, one of, um, one of my favorite um, writers on the subject of leadership is Simon Sinek. And he um, has a, a, a brilliant analogy that he uses about leadership, um, analogizes, it, analogizes it to brushing your teeth. Um, this idea that uh, if you, you know, leadership doesn't happen in big moments under spotlights at a particular uh, meeting or, uh, or, or um, crossroads or whatever it might be. In fact, leadership happens every day. Um, um, day in and day out, how we move and how we interact with those um, with whom we work. And um, so the, the, um, the, uh, the teeth brushing analogy is the idea that if you brush your teeth um, four hours um, the day before you're going in for your checkup at the dentist, you're not going to have healthy teeth, right? <laughs> the way that the way that brushing your teeth works is that you do it two minutes a day, twice a day, every single day. And leadership is very much, in my opinion, uh, the same way that we have to do, um, we have to really think about leadership as small acts that we do every single day that put into action our values and priorities. Um, so that, for example, when a leader um, asks someone how they're doing and the person says, oh man, I'm actually, I'm having a rough day, they actually stop and say, tell me more about it, not, oh, uh, well, we'll have to catch up on that later. I'm going to a meeting, right? Those kinds of things. It's, it's those kinds of everyday behaviors where leaders put their values into action that I think make for great leaders. And so that idea of, um, yes, leader, leadership is about what's inside you. Maybe what we think about is maybe innate, but really kind of who we are and what's important to us. And leadership is also about the habits that we cultivate and yeah. how we put those values into action every day in very small moments, not necessarily the big moments that we think of the retreat or the um, critical decision or the layoff or whatever it might be. Josh, if someone's in a leadership position, they say, hey, I really wish I could raise my game. What would your advice to them be? Um. It would be to strengthen the roots of your organization. And to, to Taz Neem's point, it, it really is less about these glorious spotlight moments. And you know, c coming back to Steven's roots as a kid on the farm, that there's such a strong parallel. And I'll, I'll connect it with one of the companies I've worked with for the last 10 years since their first uh, round of fundraising, which we helped them land really since they were the sapling. Um, the CEO built the company to, it's about 200 folks now, they just went public. They happen to be the largest indoor farm, somewhat ironically. And the notion of strengthening roots really resonated with the, the founder and CEO. And there are five roots that ultimately need to be nourished and are the root of pretty much every problem a company will face. So the first one is priorities. Some people think of that as your vision. And ultimately, there's a tool we call Snapshot, but it's where you document your priorities and ensure you've got alignment, alignment across leadership, and then everybody in the company is committed to that vision. There's also a discipline that comes with that, which is letting go. Because most people think they're just supposed to get everything done, and they don't have a concept of letting go because they haven't committed to any clear priorities. and so they've never experienced the freedom from anxiety they could. And a leader that can deliver that is gonna be very powerful. Second root is people. And with people, basically what you wanna do there is get clear on the principles, the purpose, and the paradigms that define you. And use that to hire, cultivate, and fire. And there's a discipline that comes there of really cultivating fit. Just one way you do that is with quarterly reviews dual reviews where you give them to directs and directs give them to their managers. And that gives people a powerful freedom from people that piss them off, right? Mm -hmm. a, a leader that can bring a system that does that, very powerful. Process third route. And process gives people freedom from a maze of confusion. A lot of people are trapped in that. 
they don't really know just where things are going or how they're supposed to get done. And that's not a good place for people to be. So there's a tool there that gives clarity on what the processes are, who's accountable for driving them, and when they need to be checked in on. Fourth root is problems. And problems is about having that IDS framework you mentioned and a weekly pulse where every group can rely on getting together to smoke out their biggest problems, get to the root, get them solved, and at next week's meeting, check in on whether the next action was taken to close the loop on every problem that comes up, right? That gives people freedom from the same problems coming back over and over. Very powerful leader who can do that. And by the way, every leader, every person is capable of cultivating these disciplines. So I would say leadership is in large part learned. And my advice to any aspiring leader would be or existing leader, cultivate those roots. Last one I'll leave you with is the fifth root paradigm. And these are the deep beliefs that are invisible to companies, right? One example is problems should be avoided. Most people grow up thinking problems are bad and avoid them. But every company and law firm and every establishment exists to solve people's problems, right? And if people are avoiding problems, they're not going to lunge into the biggest, best problems and get them solved. So that's one example of a paradigm shift at this, this client I mentioned, this indoor farming company they came down on people who have problems and much less people who messed up. And so they shifted their paradigm to a learning organization where every problem was a learning opportunity to socialize and make the whole company smarter. Nice. And, and I'll say Stephen and I were talking before the uh, webinar went live and we were both saying how committed we are to, I just want to be a tiny bit smarter or more skilled when I go to bed tonight than I was when I woke up in the morning. And if you, you find yourself in a leadership position, you know what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, you know, if, hey, I'm, I'm not organized enough, get an organization system. If that doesn't work, toss it out and get another one. I don't have enough energy to lead my team. Exercise more, eat a better diet. I don't, I'm not a good public speaker. I'm terrified. Join Toastmasters. I, I believe that everything in life, you can raise your game. Yes, I, I, wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to challenge you there a little bit because oh, back, back in the day with, with Marshall, uh, we had a chance to coach the real life Gordon Gecko, who is played out in that movie, Wall Street. And a, a fair number of leaders, though you're a very self-aware one, are very non-self-aware. Right. And this guy was, I mean, it was the board that called us in and said, this, this guy needs coaching or else he's out of here. And so we did a 360, found out he was a jerk, gave him the feedback. He said, that's just my professional persona. You got to have sharp elbows here on Wall Street. Trust me, like it's different at home. So in the, the 360, we said, can we call your family? He said, sure, have at it. Get <laughs> the phone. His wife said, he's an asshole. So he's, ah, my wife's a bad day. His son got on and his son said, my dad is a jerk. And he started crying. And that was an epiphany for him. And he turned things around. It took, it, it was an 18 month project, but a lot of people really don't know. That's why they're called blind spots for some people. Very good. Well, we're going to move to our last question here. And I'd say that as a leader, you, you can't set up and say, my goal is that this, is this company is just gonna run smoothly with no problems for the next 10 years. Problems are gonna come up if not every week, every day. Sometimes you're going to make mistakes. Last question, we'll start with Stephen, is when your organization makes a mistake, how do you guys handle it? Yeah, no, great, great question. And it is, um, you, you know, uh, mistakes and uh, crises can come in many different flavors. And so in many different levels. So it's kind of funny, I will never forget. So one of the things that for me was, one of the first days I was here in the firm and, and it was the end of the day and I'm riding the elevator down to head home. And one of the partners is, is, is riding there with me. And he looks at me, he says, Hey, Steve, great to meet you. Welcome to the team. Did you have a good day? And I kind of, I started, you know, smiled. And he said, you know, kind of gave me that look like, what, where's that from? And I said, no, no. I said, you got to understand now. After 30 years in the military, a good day is any day you end with the same number of people when you started. Everything else we can deal with. 
And I realized that that mindset is mistakes are opportunities to learn. Um, and so to be totally honest, um, focus heavily on, there's a process in the military and we've adopted it here in the firm called the after action report. And it is, it's an opportunity to talk about uh, what happened, why it happened and what we want to, there's always, there's always things that work, you know, well, even when things go bad to continue to reinforce those fix the things that, you know, that didn't go well and, um, and, and learn from it. It's that, it's that old, you know, mindset of, look, nobody's perfect and no organization is perfect. And we're not because we're an incredible collection of human beings. And we, by our very nature are not perfect because stuff happens. Um, and when it bumps into life, it tends to happen more. So, you know, we really focus on, what happened, why it happened, how we can prevent it in the future. Now, don't get me wrong. At the end of the day, I will never forget um, what Sister Dolores told me in the second grade. True story. Sitting in class, and I think it must have been art class, and I was coloring this page, and I thought I was just knocking the proverbial ball out of the park. And she walks up behind me, and she put her hand on my shoulders, and she said, Mr. Merkel, she said, I appreciate how hard you're working, but you're in the second grade and I need results. And I remember thinking, my goodness, well, actually what I was thinking was what happened to the good old days in kindergarten where you could just show up, eat a snack, take a nap, everybody went home happy. Um, but in today's life, you know, results do matter. And so multiple mistakes um, of the same nature, um, more serious mistakes, um, they obviously have to be dealt with differently, but really try to focus day in and day out on Mistakes are opportunities to learn. So I look, I am a believer. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I am going to go out there today and see what I can do to mess this up or do that wrong. It, things happen. And so um, I always give people the benefit of the doubt until there's a pattern of um, poor decision making or judgment that needs to be dealt with in a different way. So very good. Tasneem, how do you guys handle mistakes? Uh, um, I very much agree with Steve. I think, um, you know, we think of um, failures are to be celebrated because they are opportunities to learn. And uh, the only time a failure is um, is really a, a failure is when we don't learn from it, right? Um, and that being said, you know, largely because failure is often um, the result of taking a risk or doing something differently. Um, and uh, as my therapist often tells me, you don't get to break through without breakdown. <laughs> and so we do, right? Uh, just like building your muscles, the soreness is a sign of growth, right? And, um, and but you got to feel that soreness if you're going to get to the other side of the growth. And so um, I think very much, uh, uh, you know, in my, in our company, um, mistakes are something that we try to celebrate and, and the leaders go first, right? We talk about our failures first um, because you can't expect your team to surface their failures um, when the leaders uh, seem to be being perfect all the time, um, the ones who have all of the power and all of the uh, decision-making influence. So, um, in, you know, from my perspective, uh, failure is definitely um, uh, to be celebrated. That being said, uh, to Steve's point, performance is important and, um, and, you know, when something becomes a pattern of failure, when a risk is too big to take or whatever it might be, then we've got to be a little more circumspect about it. Yep. Well, I think we're going to call this a wrap. I want to just thank from the bottom of my heart, Josh, Stephen, Tasneem, uh, you guys just did a spectacular job and this was a lot of fun. And I hope all of our uh, attendees or viewers had a lot of takeaways. So everybody have a great day. Get out there and lead your teams. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.